Oh, okay. Hey, all right, I'm back. Um, as you can see, I'm in a completely different environment than I was in uh, during my previous, uh, the last video I up uploaded. And there's a cat here. <laughs> um, I recently had to move from one state to another, hence why it's taken me a while to get some videos up. And I apologize about that. Um, I did, however, get, uh, I've gotten a few requests for some more information on some of the time-lapse footage I've put up. So I did get a request on Facebook regarding this particular um, dress, this Zoom dress that I uploaded a little while back. I don't yet have time-lapse footage for this because I was recording this from the very beginning and it evolved into four, almost six hours of footage that I knew I would never have the time nor nearly the inclination to go through and edit. So I actually ended up deleting what I thought was all of the footage that I had from this because I knew I was never going to get to it. But I actually do have a little bit of footage still left over from when I was applying the animation to this character. So I'm just going to do, just going to go over that footage and do some uh, commentary over that. And then I will go into the Marvelous Designer um, file. So I'll show you how I drafted the pattern for this dress. And then I'll open up the blend file, which I still have, and show you guys how I um, applied the materials and rendered this in uh, Blender. So let's get into this. I'm just going to go through the animation real quick because I am going to have more um, in-depth tutorials about adding animation to these Daz Studio um, characters. Okay, so this is footage, sped up footage. Started in Daz Studio and I used this Michelle character from Renderosity and I made her a little bit taller so she'd be more runway model-esque height. And I exported her as an FBX file. It doesn't really matter what type of output options you use. I haven't found a difference between any of them, so the defaults will, should work just fine. Then I uploaded that FBX to Mixamo. Excuse me. And I found this uh, catwalk um, animation on Mixamo. I love using the Mixamo animations. So there's this walk animation. I made sure she was walking in place and then downloaded that animation as another FBX file. So now I have the animated FBX and I'm going to load that animated FBX back into DAS Studio. And again, I will have a more detailed step-by-step -step tutorial for adding these animations. I'm going to save that FBX animation as a post preset because that's the best way I found to copy animations and load them onto um, other Genesis 3 characters. So it's been saved as a pose preset, which actually saves the entire animation. It's not just a single pose. It does save the, po the full animation. And I'm back to the original Genesis 3 character. I actually deleted the FBX animation, and now I'm adding that animation, that pose preset, back onto the character. I've also added a little bit that two-second transition from the T-pose into the start of the walk animation so that when I start modeling the clothes, I can model onto the T-pose and then have her transition into the start of that walk animation. Now I'm going through and having to make manual adjustments to each of the keyframes, which I do not enjoy, and I'm trying to find a faster, more efficient means of doing this, but I did have to go in and manually re- um, redo her feet because the animation that comes from Mixamo adds a heel pivot, um, an ankle pivot, and I have to overcompensate for that. So I've got to go through frame by frame. Luckily, this is a short animation. It's only a couple frames long. Um, looks about like 35, 36 frames long. So I can just go in frame by frame and make sure that her feet are actually, her ankles are actually angled the way, her ankles are angled the way they should be. To fit into these shoes. So I'm doing that for the left and right foot and I'm also making sure that her feet are actually landing on the floor. Now I'm going through and I'm trying I'm adding uh, facial expressions. Again I had hoped to do this as use by using shape keys in Blender but I haven't quite figured out how to make that work. <laughs> um, so I'm going ahead and just making the changes to the character in DAS Studio. Okay, so that's where it stopped. Um, so I ended up going, I think I did end up using this facial expression. I also went through and chose certain frames to then close my character's eyes and then open them back up so that she does have a blink 
animation to her eyes. It's not very clean, um, but again, I will go over that in a future video because it's not what this is all about. <laughs> so I did add that animation, then exporting the animation as an MDD and loaded it into uh, Marvelous Designer. This is Clo. It's actually a fairly simple pattern. I've just got the front bodice here, the back of the bodice over here, and there are, I believe, three skirt pieces. One skirt piece at the front, then there's two skirt pieces in the back. There's one here and one here, and then I've got separate materials for the hems, this white hem. Um, and that's just an offset line. Now, I did want this really... I did want this really deep, deep V that comes from the neck all the way down to the waistline. Um, and to do that, I added these, I took the original neckline that I had, and then I cut these individual pieces off, just dropped an internal pattern line down and then cut and sewed that to make it its own pattern piece. So there's one on either side. And I gave this particular fa uh, this particular piece of fabric a boning material, which I ended up using the simulated leather belt preset in the program. It's stiff enough to provide a good amount of strength and body that that part of the neck that part of the neckline stays rigid, but it's um, loose enough that it still has a little bit of m movement to it. Um, the bodice pieces, rather than have darts or open seams at the uh, along the upper part of the bodice, I actually wanted it to pleat, kind of overlap itself. So I've got these two seam lines, well they're not seam lines, but these two internal lines here. Um, one is given a fold angle of 360 degrees. Yes. Wow. What do you want? But if I open the window... Come. So I gave this internal line a fold angle of 360 degrees, which is a valley fold, if I'm not mistaken. So this internal line, which sits underneath here, underneath here, is folded valley fold on itself rather than a mountain fold. It's a valley fold like that. Um, and then you will see here, these two little white dots are actually pins, they're tack pins. So I've tacked one part of the fabric to the other part of the fabric so it stays folded, kind of pleated over itself. Um, the bodice pieces, the front and back bodice, I'm utilizing a simulated collar with interlining fabric preset. And by using that, it's, it adds a little bit more body to the bodice, a little bit more stiffness, especially when it comes to, you know, making sure this stays rigid because it is a pretty deep um, neckline along the back. Um, then the skirt, the skirt fabric is, I use the simulated full grain leather for that, which is actually a little bit stiffer, I find than the simulated leather belt, which I use for the boning pieces. But this is a full grain leather simulation and that's what creates this like really cool, kind of this undulating pattern. Um, the skirt is also pleated to the waistband. You'll see if I zoom in here, we've got an internal line that goes up here yeah, we've got this internal line here that's highlighted in yellow that again has a higher fold angle. I didn't go as high as a 360 degree fold angle, but 270. So it folds, the fabric folds back in on itself. Uh, to, to be honest, I start with a basic uh, sloper pattern and I just slashed and spread that sloper pattern until it was the size, the skirt had the fullness that I wanted. And then I went through and created these fold lines. I actually ended up starting from the, the front of this and adding uh, the fold line and then mirroring, mirroring it by unfolding it. Um, so I'd have mirror images of the uh, pleat lines. 
Now, the biggest problem I ran into while making this dress were these studs on the bodice. I really wanted these studs because I was basing this design off of um, uh, sea, sl uh, sea slug? Flatworm. Yeah, flatworm that <laughs> I was basing them off of a, uh, an aquatic, uh, an oceanic flatworm. And this flatworm has these little yellow, almost these little yellow um, bobbles on its back. And I wanted that. It was like integral to this design. So to make my life easier, I thought, I was going to add these little buttons here in Marvelous Designer. But the problem I ran into was every time I would run the simulation, these little buttons would keep phasing out in between the bodice. They would flip upside down. They'd end up, they would sink through the, um, through the bodice material. And the only, only way I found to change that was by making the, um, fabric these bodice pieces a super high poly count it was the only way I could manage to keep these things from slipping through the fabric and I think it's set to a five millimeter particle distance which I never go to I very rarely if ever lower my particle distance to five millimeters because the density on this bodice is stupid <laughs> I also uh, utilized pinning lots of pinning um, you can see when I go into the pin modifying tool, you can see here are these tack pins. Let's see, let me zoom in here. This little guy here is the same as these tack pins here. So this is just fabric, tack to fabric. And I have the same thing on the other side. This is another tack pin here. And then I've got pins here, which are actually um, pinned to the avatar. So she doesn't get any slippage on her shoulders when she's walking. So I've got, excuse me, I've got two pins, one on each side, holding the garment to the character's uh, shoulders. I also have two pins here, pinned into her boobies, which I'm sure is not comfortable. And if this were a garment that you would actually make, if it were something that I decided to actually make to put on a le real person, it would just be a case of putting double-sided sticky tape to avoid any nip slips, because don't nobody want none of that. <laughs> okay, future Marjorie here. While I was editing this footage, I realized that I had a lot of lag in my recording, and I wanted to come back in here and better explain how I created this um, texture, this uh, material in Blender. So I've got two different mapping nodes because one mapping node is going to the uh, normal map which gives a little bit of texture to this velvet uh, material. The other mapping node, you'll see the scale has been reduced. Um, that's the mapping node for this kind of undulating wave pattern that I included. I wanted this oceanic wave type print to appear on the fabric since this entire garment is based on an oceanic creature. Um, but the scale of this particular image was way too big so I had to reduce it. In scale that's why there's two different mapping nodes now for the material itself I've got a normal map plugged into a velvet shader this is a velvet shader that just comes with um, blender which works surprisingly well and it's set to a dark gray not entirely black but dark gray and then I have a glossy shader added as well I'm using a GGX glossy shader this is slightly darker than the velvet shader itself. So I've got the velvet shader coming into the top of this mix shader and I've got a glossy shader coming into the bottom and for the factor I'm actually using this undulating image, this black and white undulating oceanic 
wave type image. That way it's only glossy in these certain areas. Okay, back to past Marjorie now. So I like that it seems to give the effect of velvet that's almost like shaved. In some areas it looks matte, and in some areas it looks glossy, almost like longer and shorter fibers on the velvet. I did go, um, I did create a three-point lighting system. I get accustomed to doing a three-point lighting system on all of these renders. I think this is my fill light. Yep, that's my fill light coming from over there. You can see it on the ground here. It's shining this way. I've got my key light over there, which has a slightly uh, warmer color to it. This is actually very warm. Um, oh, no, we don't want that. And then my backlight. It's very big, but it's a very low strength. Um, you can see it's kind of a, a cooler purple, almost. Uh, it's a purple kind of color. I tend to do that. That That's almost all of my renders have a three-point lighting system with the fill light being white most of the time. And then the key light and the backlight, I switch up between being warm and cool. So you have couple of different colors appearing on the character at once. Now I did do a turntable for this. She is animated to walk, but I did do a turntable for her. You can see it's it's spinning around. I have found it's much easier to make a static camera and make everything else in the scene spin around on um, a central axis rather than keep everything in the scene static and make the camera move around. I've had a really hard time with getting camera movements to work in Blender with making sure they stay focused on a particular, you know, on one element in the scene while having them rotate around and stay tracked to um, my character. So anytime I'm doing a turntable in Blender, you'll notice down here, I've got this guy here. This is just a plain axis, it's just an empty that I bring into the scene and then I parent everything in the scene except for the camera you can see here when you look at the outliner all i've got is the empty and the camera the empty is the parent for everything else once i have everything set up the way i want it to be i create an empty scale it up a little bit um apply its root uh, apply its scale and then i parent everything in the scene except for the camera to that empty and then all i need to do is animate the empty spinning around the empty's not doing anything, it stays static, but then we get to this frame. Let's see, it looks like frame 160. Once the camera has gotten itself where it needs to be, I've locked a keyframe there for the empty to start, and then I have the empty spinning around from 0 to negative 360. Yeah, negative 360 at the end of the rotation. That's where the other keyframe is right here. So the empty spins and everything else spins around with it. So I will get, I will have videos up with much more details on getting Mixamo animations and BVH animations applied to DAS characters. Um, I do have some more requests for a couple more, uh, a couple of the other designs that I've posted. So I will have more in-depth um, information about those. I am going to be working, um, I am working on a behind the scenes, very much like this one, um, for the Garuda design that I did, which everyone's been kind of like enjoying. <laughs> so I'll show you guys how I did that. It's really, it's much, much easier than you would think. So thank you so much for watching. I will have more videos up similar to this, the, the kind of behind the scenes um, videos for some of the existing time-lapse footage uh, that I've already posted on YouTube. If you got any questions or comments or concerns, leave those in the comments down below. If there's any kinds of garments that you'd like to see me um, attempt, <laughs> let me know and I'll see what I can do about getting that done. I will have some more videos up because I have had other requests for some of the other time-lapse footage pieces that I have uploaded. I'm, I promise I'm going to get some behind the scenes um, uh, videos for those. <laughs> But thank you very, very much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks, bye.